Welcome to the show, everybody. My name is Pete Wright, and I'm here with Dane Christensen. This is Dane Christensen, y'all. Yeah. Hello, Dane Christensen. How do you do? How do you? Uh, we are the Naked Marketers. We are uh, without the uh, lovely and talented Megan Strand today. Apparently, according to her text, her day has imploded. And so we don't know what that means, uh, but, <laughs> but we hope she's okay. Uh, we... <laughs> We have a lot of stories to talk about uh, today, and so we're only going to talk about a couple of them because there are way too many to talk about. The first and the biggest one, we got to talk about the Super Bowl. What did you think of the Super Bowl? The ads. The ads. Oh, I was going to say. Because who cares about the game? I was going to say, a game picked up in the second half there. Um, yes, well, you know, I'm one of those nerds that primarily doesn't care who's playing and watches for the for the ads themselves. Mm-hmm. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a, a general synopsis, my sort of who cares view of it. Um, when what I mean by that is who cares what I think view of it. I, I care uh, what you, I care what you <laughs> They're always entertaining, right? Like it doesn't disappoint on an entertaining level. Um, I, I just am so baffled and, and kind of got frustrated actually during the course of the game at how many ads looked like a, just a mountain of money had been spent on them and they were beautiful and, um, whatever, expensive, beautiful, elegant, funny. And I couldn't, I, you, you can't identify like, what's the brand? How's anyone going to remember this? Um, 30 seconds later, I asked somebody, so that video, or that commercial you just saw, what was that for? Do you know? It's like a testing, you know, my family. Um, they're, well, <laughs> cause they're not, they're not all the marketing nerds that I am, but, and, right. and people couldn't, and no one would know a lot of the time. So that that continues to baffle me. That isn't the case with all the ads, right? But a lot of car ads I thought were that way. Like I, I was would say just the gonna... car industry did poorly there. Wait, can I say that again. I said the car industry in general did very poorly on really establishing brand recognition with their ads. Like brand, like I remember what car that was or what company. Oh. I thought I thought the car commercials did that poorly. Okay, so if I were to say to you, do you remember the Tommy ad? Tommy is in a well. Tommy is in. Do you remember that ad? No, and I and I really only was like I'm testing. See, I'm testing out. you now, and it turns out that you were you were on an an ADD bender and probably hyped up on, you know, whatever well, it is you're hyped up on. But, life. No, but you you see, what I'm, like I I actually disagree with you because I think I thought the ads were great. I think a couple of them missed the missed the mark. The Audi released the hounds ad. I thought was a little bit um, uh, funky. Uh, the old luxury prison theme with all the rich people in prison. Uh, I didn't quite get it. Um, but the, the the Tommy ad, I thought, was terrific. The Chevy Silverado ad, wa- it was this truck that was like Lassie. And uh, the Silverado was like Lassie. It was this kind of disembodied car with without a driver. And it would... It would drive up to the to the house, and the the guy would be out there, you know, doing something really manly, like chopping wood or you know, mending a fence and and um, uh, you know, gutting a buffalo. And and the car would honk, and he would say, "What? Tommy's in a well?" And and then it would show the car rescuing Tommy somehow. And and it, he was Tommy was in these progressively more kind of complicated scenarios. It was it, eventually he ended up in the belly of a whale. And, well, uh, and this is this is why my analysis doesn't mean a whole bunch. I mean, I did not watch the entire, <laughs> you know, game, so I didn't see all these ads. And I'm generalizing, and sort of noticed at a couple of points there that, like, wow, there goes a couple of car commercials in a row, yeah. and there were maybe more luxury brands or something that I just thought, hmm. Well, and I derailed myself because I actually had a point which I thought was interesting. I think there were more car commercials, like more of that sort of big iron kind of big brand commercials than than uh, in years past. Like I think we're seeing few. Uh, we saw fewer of the um, kind of get rich startups and and kind of a return of the of the really splashy big brand ads. The Coca Cola Siege ad is one of those that. Um, wow, that was it, wild. Right? That was crazy, and that's another one out of our uh, our friends uh, Wyden Kennedy Portland here. Oh, they did that one they did that oh, one, which i thought was, it was a really amazing commercial. yeah it was it an really amazing was. ad and and you know you remember it's coke i mean it was definitely it had the product kind of front and center in this world of warcraft kind of uh animated uh universe which i thought was great i thought silverado had the chevy kind of front and center audi did i didn't get the chrysler uh do you remember the chrysler born of fire ad uh it was the oh, one no. with uh, m&m 
No, uh, I. Well, that's one that I saw part of and wasn't quite sure what the product was. Because it's like a feature film. It, it kind of ra- it was a 120-second um, uh, ad, and it's another one out of Wyden Kennedy, Portland. Um, they, it ended up just sort of telling the story of Detroit, right? Uh, and it, it was this, this um, you know, what is Detroit known for? You know, we're, no, we're not known for luxury. We're not known for this. We're not known for that. And then Eminem shows up and he points his finger broodingly at the camera and he says, we're Detroit. This is what we do. Uh, and it's got some, you know, he's got... I heard his. that one scored well. It did. It scored well. I, I think it scored well with the, because it had the same kind of sentiment that the, the GM Apology ad series had, right? That we're, mm. we're really sorry we're going to pay back all the money and, and uh, get ourselves back on our feet. Um, very brand focused, not necessarily focused on a particular product. So, Well, it was, a, it was a big opportunity for cars because they're showing, you know, an increase in sales and profitability. And, you know, it's kind of like they had a real opportunity yeah. to, to uh, I don't know, to, to really take off on that. And I guess, you know, maybe in some cases they did, they did well. And I don't know, in other cases, and I would agree, Audi was one where I was like, gosh, it's like they're almost trying to hide the fact that they're selling you an Audi here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but still, but, the number... it doesn't mean it wasn't pretty to watch. But you know, right, I, right. I, I just think I think the movie ads, and I I don't know if it's just me, but I felt like we were seeing more movie ads during the Super Bowl than I remember in the past. What do you, you mean, actual trailer ads? Tra- yeah, exactly. Prom- promotions for upcoming yeah. films, big films. Those were good. They were. Which ones those... stick out to you? <laughs> nothing, right? Nothing. Because nothing. No, they were good, but they didn't really resonate. And and the one that always you know I mean beverages just do really well. Yeah. Doritos has has capitalized, uh, and you know you know you're seeing a, a Doritos commercial, and you and then you remember that you did. Um, but you know the beer commercials, I don't know. I mean, it's kind of a. I, I guess the thing for me is it's not really a new story. That's kind of the same thing every year. Like I think beer especially, and Coke, and lots of beverages, and some chips, like they do really well at. You remember you saw the ad, whether it was the greatest ad you've ever seen in your life or not, doesn't really matter. Right. You, you just knew what you were being advertised. What do you, where do you stand on the uh, Groupon ad? Apparently scored the worst of the ads uh, of the Super Bowl. Well, and, it, it, and this one sort of fits in the category of what was it, right? Yeah. The, the, uh, an ad that confused people in general, and they don't really know. <laughs> Somebody spent a lot of money on an ad, and no one quite knew what was going on. Yeah. I mean, I think that's a big sin. Well, it, it was. It's a fascinating kind of a blunder because I think there was a real opportunity. I mean, you know, I. I, I so the the concept of the ad is uh, Timothy Hutton is 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 got his voice uh, over some, you know, the uh, slow dolly shots over the mystic uh, panoramas of the Himalayas. You know, and he's saying Tibet is in crisis and their culture is in danger of of uh, you know of vanishing from the face of the earth and things are really really bad cut to timothy hutton in a restaurant and he says but they sure do make a mean fish curry <laughs> and right <laughs> and you know it turns out that it's an ad for groupon which is um uh, you know, which is uh, who doesn't know what Groupon does, which is the the kind of bundling coupon site, uh, and uh, that if you know if a whole bunch of people get together and they put in their their fifteen dollars, they end up getting thirty dollars worth of of coupons at these Timothy uh, at a uh, Tibetan restaurant. There was no mention in the ad that there was any sort of charitable donation as as part of the Groupon deal for Tibet. And it's almost like a copywriter was sitting there and 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 edited out a line by mistake. You know what I mean? Like it just felt like <laughs> such a stupid blunder. Like you just one line would have would have totally fixed this, but they they but that line was missing. The line that said, "By the way, we're giving a metric boatload of money to Tibet if you do this." That's all you need to say. Metric boatload of money to Tibet, and then everything is okay. But that was not there, and as a result, people went crazy about this Groupon ad as one of the most tasteless uh, ads they've seen. I thought it was pretty funny. I do like me some Timothy Hutton, though. Uh, are you there? Hey, Pete. Yeah, did you, uh, are you there? Did we have some connection problem? Some connection issue. All right. All right, how do I sound to you? Oh, you sound great. 
Sorry to do this in the middle of the show. No, that's all right. So the but I'm the getting uh, fuzziness. The the group on ad uh, the group on ad didn't play well. I wish Megan was here because I know she'd be up in arms about how people missed the point about right uh, right the. Uh, <laughs> that charitable giving bit. Uh, in other stories of classlessness, not related to the, uh, uh, you know, to the Super Bowl, Kenneth Cole. Um, what do you think of this Kenneth Cole Twitter thing? Apparently, this guy doesn't have a lot of uh, couth. He's couthless. <laughs> Apparently, he just sort of misjudged the sensitivity of a particular issue. Yeah, that's. <laughs> uh, it's pretty funny. I, th- it was about. Well, a tweet. it continues. It continues to be funny to watch. You know, um, whatever. Well, I was going to say CEOs of a certain age, but really, just people with <laughs> people with business responsibility or political responsibility just sort of get used to this little Twitter device. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> get used to the Twitter when is, device. When is it good to use it, and when isn't it? And what do you say? So true. In this case, uh, you know, we've got some issues going on in Egypt. If you haven't heard, uh, people are in uh, having some uh, issues related to you know overthrowing the government. And uh, Kenneth Cole says uh, on Twitter, millions are in uproar in hashtag Cairo. Rumor is they heard our new spring collection is now available online at http colon bitly dot Cairo. Which seems innocent enough, except that people have died in this uprising. Exactly. And people not have a, been a violently hurt. Wholly peaceable uprising. And it's, uh, it is uh, something not to make, you know, you want to say too soon, too soon. It's just not, uh, not to make jokes of. And this is, I, I think you're exactly right. It's people are getting used to the general sentiment of Twitter in, in an era when, uh, you know, there is so much discussion about the role Twitter plays in actually uh, supporting these sorts of cultural change. Well, and can I admit something really quick here? You can. I do on occasion listen to the Jim Rome show. Oh. Not not often, but on occasion. Dark days. Dark and days. he has started using Twitter, right? Yeah. And I, I just get a kick out of him. I think he's a funny guy. Um, but he, 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 he has gone on these rants that I just love listening to where he's like, he was talking to somebody like a show producer or something, a younger person who was about to go on a, like it was the, uh, the uh, Chicago Bears Green Bay game. And he had like, you know, a day and a half he was going to be there and not sleep and probably drink a lot. And he's like, he just, he's like, turn off Twitter. Don't use Twitter. You're going to want to use Twitter. You're going to be there. You're going to be seeing, like, you're going to think it's kind of your responsibility because you're part of a sports show to use Twitter. You're going to be drinking. Don't do it. And then he's like, no, I'm serious. I'm dead serious. Twitter is a loaded gun. It's a loaded gun without a safety. Wow. If you, if you pick up a beer, put down Twitter. And like he goes on, and it's funny. It's really is, very funny. Is he? Does he? Is he afflicted with some sort of a, a condition? Does he have no, some sort of a Tourette's a, kind of a? You know, it's this sort of thing. Like I just kind of picture Kenneth Cole maybe at dinner after a couple glasses of wine. I'm not saying he was drunk. I'm just saying it's possible he wasn't at his full. You know, like had full faculties when he thought, "Hey, this will be funny." I'll, yeah, you know, I'll, <laughs> that's I'll right. I'm just saw this image of Cairo. Hey, like maybe I'm at a bar with some friends. And He's I think, on his third oh, glass of scotch. That could be just like, hey, I'll just post this. This will be funny. Yeah. And uh, I, I, I don't know. So it's just, it's kind of funny to me. I just think, and we don't know, right? I mean, now he's got to apologize for it. Who knows? Lapse in judgment. I, I don't know what the whole deal is there, but... <laughs> well, I love your comment. It's it's executives getting used to the whole Twitter device, and that's uh, I think that's interesting, especially when you have stories like uh, the this Virgin Air story. Did you see this thing? Can I just say real quick? Yeah. I wish there was a Twitter device. I think you know, there, like I think there is, and it was canceled very shortly after it was launched. <laughs> It'd be like a pager. It'd be great. It's exactly what that's exactly what it was, and then everybody realized, right? I have to pay two hundred bucks for this thing, <laughs> and all it does is Twitter. Really. Which, which real quickly, funniest part of ha- the Hangover movie is when the, they're checking into Caesar's Palace. How's your pager reception here? Anyway, <laughs> keep going. Sorry. <laughs> I not, need a, pa- not, I need a pager sure. just to have one. You do. Just to put on my belt so that like, if I'm in line at Chipotle, I can just lift it up you and make sure check, people see I have a pager. <laughs> I had a pager. I, I lived in Korea for uh, for a couple of years, and and pagers were very big. 
uh, <laughs> in in Korea, and it was all I could get because I was I was living on you know cash work and and uh, didn't have any credit over there. So I got my little pager, and it was it was fascinating because you get you get back into all the codes. You know, people people page you codes like here's my phone number nine one one. That means you got to call me back really urgently because I use nine one one. Or, nice. or they do the, yeah. you know, they they start doing the five three one one zero, you know, hello, uh, <laughs> just to say, just to say hi. <laughs> There's just only so much you can really do with those codes. It's fantastic. I miss it. I miss it a great deal. Uh, let's talk about Virgin uh, Virgin Air, Airways. <laughs> you, you almost ever, said first, stewardesses, <laughs> you know, no, no, because... air waitresses. <laughs> I, I don't. I I know they don't call them air waitresses anymore. <laughs> I am sh- almost sure of that. Uh, okay. Maybe on Virgin the, Airlines they, they, they do. I, they, they did you the, the best looking stewardesses in the world apparently, based on a recent survey. So I'll just say that. But as a company, yes. What Pete? What do you have to tell us? I can't recover from that. <laughs> you're like you're. You just you just totally pulled a can of coal. Well, they no, they they just they squashed the competition. I, I think uh, Air Singapore maybe was second, and I don't remember. Scandia Air was maybe on there, but it was like no contest. Virgin but, Airlines by the, far the best away. looking, best looking uh, flight attendants is what they actually attendants. call them. Yeah, uh, they. Uh, I I don't even know what to say to that. Uh, well, that was not the story. It's not. It's not worth commenting. But on. it is actually worth noting it's a that. Fact. Now no. Yeah, it is. It is a fact that we now know, and all the more re- you know, all the more reason because you know it, it, to be uh, uh, surrounded by the beautiful people. It makes the rest of us uh, <laughs> makes the rest of us feel good or bad. Um, so the the real story here is this: what uh, uh, turns out, Virgin, according to uh, Porter Gale, the airline's top marketer, uh, Twitter, they probably and, have for that position. Do you think? Well, she like actually. They actually direct. say in this ad age article, "Top marketer, the airline's top marketer." Okay. Uh, that Twitter and Facebook are more important than TV. Why do you? Why would you uh, suppose that is, Dane? You know. <laughs> um. Note: I have the answer, so this is kind of a quiz. Okay, so I don't know the answer. I'm going to throw this out there, though. <laughs> Um, a company can't say that unless they're really, they have a good effective strategy, um, that they feel is working, that they've somehow, um, been able to connect their company and their message with their customers or potential customers. If they've done that using social media tools, then it becomes that valuable, right? I, I mean, it, so you, they can't. You can't make a blanket blanket statement like that and say, "Well, for every company, then you you need to pay attention to the fact that you know these things are more valuable because Virgin says so than TV is." Um, I think a company has to be in a position to be able to say that because they their their strategy has been effective. Right. Right. As it turns out, you are right. Uh, I, in more words than that, it she uh, Porter Gale says that one of the reasons that Twitter and and uh, you know these social media tools have been so effective for for Virgin is that they have they use them not just for a marketing channel but as an engagement and support channel. When people complain uh, on Twitter about about delays or service interruption, they end up you know they'll they'll go out and send them a two hundred dollar uh, voucher for a, for a ticket directly you know as a result of that tweet. They use it as an engagement tool to build loyalty. And some products lend themselves to this sort of use on Twitter. Some products definitely don't. But to figure out what your what your sort of brand strategy is for using social media and how you can use it as a customer support and uh, sort of a, a, a tool for evangelists of the product um, is is really tantamount to success there. What she says in an interesting uh, here's here's a, a, a part I thought was interesting. Uh, Ad Age asks, what can other uh, no. Uh, is is it driving, is social media driving a significant amount of revenue for the airline? Her response, it is constantly increasing in terms of revenue that it is bringing in. So we are happy about that. In particular, at one point, we did a sale with Twitter called the Fly Forward Give Back Sale and used promoted tweets to help push it. And that was our fifth most successful single day ever in terms of ticket sales. So there are two things going on there. First of all, she doesn't actually answer the question. Is it driving significant amounts of revenue for the airline? 
she didn't say yes, right? She said it's constantly increasing, which is good. You want it to go up, it, but it, does that mean it's significant? It, we don't we don't know that, and we we've talked in past weeks uh, about you know brands that have conflicting uh, experiences. Yeah, but the fact that this Twitter sale causes the fifth most successful day ever in terms of sales uh, seems to me to be important. Well, and that's very much the kind of thing that a company would say if somebody said, "Hey, that commercial you just did was really awesome. Has that, you know, I mean, has that delivered significant revenue for you?" Well, you, you're rarely in a position to be able to say, "Oh, absolutely, we can connect this many dollars to that commercial, and you know, here's the ROI, and and here's you know, on a on a uh, from a data perspective, exactly how it did." You don't know exactly how it did, but you certainly can say. You know, we ran that commercial for one week, or we ran it, you know, heavy rotation during, say, American Idol uh, final show or something like that. And it was our biggest day of sales ever. So it's never a black and white answer. And that's what's kind of interesting about social media, and I think is very good, is that even though people continue to look for ways to really create, you know, social media metrics so that somebody can look at a top level report and say, you know, this is what we're putting into it and here's what we're getting out of it. Mm -hmm. It is more of a moving target in a way that I think requires continued creativity. You aren't just managing an ongoing campaign that's based on like the cost per click or something like that. You have experiences and, and evolution and gee, we used, we used these tools to promote a campaign or, 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 or to push a sale or um, to increase awareness of a particular message. And 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 on in those instances, we saw huge activity, huge response, increase in sales, you know, whatever. It was short term. But they haven't necessarily they may or may not have created a long term branding impact that that a TV commercial might or a good visual campaign might. But in both cases, they're hard to measure. Right, right. Well, and it's it's it becomes increasingly hard to measure when when it, you know these things are working so naturally together. Like it's hard to measure the success of an individual Super Bowl ad as it performed during the actual broadcast of the Super Bowl, considering these ads had been up and played out on YouTube for a week prior to uh, prior to the actual Super Bowl. Um, you know, they'd already been tweeted. I mean, we watched the 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 ad that tested most favorably for the Super Bowl was the Volkswagen Darth uh, or the Force ad. But we had been talking about that a week ago when it it launched uh, on the internet uh, on the show last week. And speaking of car ads, that was a great one. That, that was one of the best. Yeah, um, yeah. It's up with the uh, the Folgers. Uh, you know, Peter ad. Remember that? No, I don't, I don't remember that. Kid come, guy comes home from college for Christmas. You don't remember that? That's the legendary ad. That's the ad, uh, the bar by which all others strive to uh, to achieve in terms of you know, pulling I, emotional heartstrings. You are dead inside. No, I, I vaguely remember it. Um, but all I right. got to tell you, I was driving my little girl to to a little preschool the other day, and she said, <laughs> "I said something about like you'll have to remind me about that later, Elsa." She's four. She goes, yeah, because sometimes you forget, Dad, huh? <laughs> sometimes you're forgetful. <laughs> so yeah, well, if she if she knew the half of it, right? <laughs> um, all right. So it, great news from Ad Age. It's an interesting interview with uh, with Porter Gale, um, uh, and and worth reading. And but I, I I think the lessons are 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 fairly broad on uh, on how you know how we can use Twitter and social media in general as just another tool in the toolkit. Um, Let's see. What else did we have to talk about? I know we had some other things to talk about. What did I miss? Well, should we talk about AOL and Huffington Post? Do it. That was so, big news. No, it was big news, right? AOL, yeah. AOL buys Huffington Post. Uh, Huffington Post, as a news source, is not necessarily for everybody, um, right? I mean, it's a it's a little uh, slanted, perhaps. Um, uh, I, I happen to. Um, I happen to read Huffington Post quite a bit, so, uh, but I think it did surprise a lot of people that um, they have kind of been, they made the most revenue. They've they've got, I mean, they 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 do really really well. And is it because they have, you know, the greatest journalists? <laughs> uh, do they write the best stories? Well, there's a story in Slate magazine by, and you're gonna have to say his name, Farad Manju. Manju. Yes. Anyway, great story. Uh, 
the, the, the title of, and I, I actually just love the title of it. It says, uh, so Huffington Post Achilles heel search engine optimization won't work forever. So Pete and I, you know, do work in uh, search engine optimization there. Um, it's, it's not that search optimization is in any danger of becoming irrelevant, but the techniques that Huffington Post and actually many other um, online uh, media outlets use is basically, let's call it keyword stuffing. And what, is, what does keyword stuffing mean? <laughs> well, actually, the technique is used in writing this article as sort of a parody of the fact that it's you know so shamelessly used in many Huffington Post articles. And so the, the article starts out with... Um, uh, it's like second paragraph. Before I go on, let me stop and say a couple of more important things. AOL. AOL acquires Huffington Post. AOL buys Huffington Post. AOL buys AOL buys Huff Post. AOL Huffington Post. Huffington Post. Huffington Post. AOL. Huffington Post. AOL mergers. Huffington Post Media Group. Huffington Post sold. Huff Post. AOL. Blah 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 blah. See what I did there? That's what you call search engine optimization. Um, and then he cites an example story that the Huffington Post did called what time does the super bowl start and it's this like three or four paragraph story that provides you absolutely no useful information at all but very carefully uses um the names of the teams and the location and the stadium and the the um the names of the of the halftime acts and the names of the coaches and some of the bigger players and like all the things that you just kind of hope might get this story to get picked up somehow right um, to me, this is just, it's, 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 so it's less a story really about search engine optimization as some like insidious thread going through the current news evolution that I think hopefully dies sooner than later. The, well, the notion that you do stories based on what's trending, topics that are popular, things that basically what that means is people are searching for. And then you write the story or then write it and have an editor go back through it to make sure you insert words and phrases and variations on those, not because they help the story, not because it makes it more intelligent, but because it makes it more likely to be, you know, picked up by the search engine and thrown to the top. You know, this is, uh, I, I, I hear your point. And I wonder if there, if we're in any danger of losing this. When you look at at AOL's strategy behind buying HuffPo, I mean, as you said, I mean they they bought Huffington Post because, you know, it it is, uh, it is a heavily trafficked site and has a lot of potential because of this strategy. Add to that the the uh, the AOL Way presentation that was leaked uh, from the the president of AOL last week, um, which outlines their strategy behind making sure all of AOL's assets, media assets, are doing the same thing, making sure yep. that they are yep. reviewing their 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 editorial uh, catalog for search optimization and uh, um, ad insertion uh, potential. And right. This, I mean, am I understanding yeah, that right? Right. You are, and and this comes from their their new CEO. I don't know how new he is, but uh, Tim Armstrong, who was, who comes from Google. I can't remember what his position was at Google, but he's a Google man. So, um, yeah, it's <laughs> it is uh, not something that you can really ignore. I, I mean, if you're really on top of this and you're saying. And again, you know, I mean, I read the Huffington Post because I am going to my search bar and I put H-U-F and it finishes the sentence. And, you know, it's just a news source I check. I really, it, but, you know, plenty of people are just, you know, are, are they're looking for news on whatever, on suit. Like, well, like you might enter a search term and, and this is very possible that what the Huffington Post did was they were, and I'm certain of this, and it, um, I, I would bet money this happens all day long. People, they they spot like Google Trends. Wow, there are a lot of searches for what time does the Super Bowl start? Let's do a story on what time the Super Bowl starts. So that when people do that search in Google and they ask Google what time the Super Bowl starts, one of the top answers will be the Huffington Post telling you what time it starts. Right. And so what we'll do is we'll create this short story. We'll stuff it with all the variations. Like maybe they're asking what time does the Black Eyed Peas start? But, you know... Just just put enough of those word combinations into the story that you're going to be a, an answer to a question. Right, right. Well, it's interesting. And I think, you know, you get these companies that spin off like demand media. Have you heard about these guys? 
Um, I believe so, yes. So these, this is the company that does the... Like um, a copywriting farm, basically, exactly. for stories so, like this. Exactly. So they do all the search engine, uh, or they do all the, the research on what people are searching for, and then they go write content to try to insert that content into, you know, the discussion that's already happened in, in search. Uh, you know, I think it was actually somebody from Slate who did a little experiment for a couple of weeks of writing for that company because they just, they sort of farm this stuff out. Yeah, you, to freelancers, right. Exactly. It's all like freelance driven and you can sort of sign up and you get paid a pittance. But if you're fast and you're good and it's what, if it's something you kind of have a talent for, like you can just pop out a story without like blinking uh, and you can do it based on, hey, we need these, you know, these search terms. It, they, 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 there was a little formula they came up with. This was like six months ago, but how much could you really make in a year or a month and how much time would you have to... It kind of worked out too. If you're really good and you do this all the time, you could maybe get yourself around $30, $40 an hour, I think. Mm -hmm. I might have that number wrong, but no one's going to get rich. No, no, not no. Building right, these articles. You know, good to, the, the people who employ all those uh, writers are, are going to get rich. The, somebody's going to get somebody's rich. getting rich on this thing. The, the, it's just an interesting. It's an interesting thing because what what's happening with Google right now is you're starting to hear this. Um, um, you're starting to hear this general kind of vein of discontent uh, about Google and the search results that are coming up in Google. That they are being stuffed by these search engine or, or search optimized pages that that and and the quality of the results is is dropping precipitously. Well, Would you agree? It, it, yeah, and here's the thing. You know, this used to be. This is why this, I think, is sort of. I, I would think its time is maybe not um, not long. I suppose because this used to be a technique for for you know home pages, and there were a couple of things that were done, and you still will kind of see this where someone will take their home page to their website and they'll just make sure all you know all the areas that they serve are in there and all the kinds of products and services they have, and so they're all relevant, um, but. But but what what would happen is if you, uh, for instance, let's say then in in white font because you have a white background to your website, you then include, you know, a whole bunch of whatever like two hundred words that maybe aren't even relevant but are top search terms or they're your competitors' names or you know they're they're things that just don't really add up. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't that long ago, but I don't know how many years ago that you know that actually worked for people and then instead of it not working anymore um google actually then penalized you so that kind of thing may get you dropped out of search results or score you you know way down the list because you're trying to trick things in an article it's not quite the same thing there's there's still a lot more leeway for somebody to post an article where the words you aren't disguising you aren't like trying to embed words in the background you aren't you aren't right i mean like, even on huffington putting... post they they hide them in the uh the read more segment at the very top of all their articles you can read more and that's where all of the the uh search links are right yeah they do right search links are a big part of these things i mean it's just one of those things that it, it used to work on a company's website it now you know doesn't they they've found ways to 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 not let the company that actually, I mean, the idea obviously is that you want a result that matters to you. So if I'm looking for a company in my town that has a service, I hope I get kind of, you know, what I'm looking for and not a company that's actually in another state, but has listed my city or, you know, they have bad reviews or they're a smaller company or just whatever, but they've, but they have enough SEO knowledge that they've gotten their page up there, but it's not relevant to me. And the ways that they got it, you know, to, to show up for my search result are kind of trickery so google always just trying to figure out how do we you know how do we get that person down and and make it actually relevant and that's um easier said than done and i just think it it they're a little ways from catching up in the news side of you know right the the, the news arena well you know we are running up to the end of our uh of our time here but i think we have two more things did you want to talk about this uh this uh sem I don't. I, I, I think uh, I think we kind of burned okay. out our SEO SEM right. topic. Then let's first talk about uh, then let's talk about I rejected here I capitalism just because it's funny. Please, we'll end, we'll end on a funny. Uh, this is an app that does that you cannot find in the iTunes Store for for or the uh, iTunes App Store. But we thought it it's a it, it's a really priceless um, 
Well, you judge for yourself. Here is the description of the game. It is called I Capitalism. When I was young, I had all the time in the world to play video games, but no money to buy them. As an adult, I have all the money in the world to buy games, but no time to play them. Are you tired of games that require time, effort, and worst of all, skill to play? If so, iCapitalism is the game for you. iCapitalism is the world's first game entirely driven by microtransactions. There is literally no gameplay outside of the ability to upgrade your character using real money. How do I play? Well, click on the Play tab, then increase your level. You'll be presented with a list of level upgrades you can purchase with real money. So wait, there's no skill involved? None at all. The person who pays us the most wins. The rest are displayed on a leaderboard in descending order. Does my money get me anything besides a higher spot on the leaderboard? Well, when you increase your level, you can enter a custom message. All other players can see this when you're on the leaderboard. The top player becomes the head honcho, and their inevitably more important message will be the first thing everyone sees when they boot the app. I thought that was absolutely priceless. So it is, it's essentially, if you're a big Farmville player, this app is for you. Uh, the, the whole idea is uh, all you do is uh, spend your money on nothing. And uh, <laughs> they did a great job. The company uh, actually is uh, uh, made by the folks behind Forum Wars, which is a browser-based RPG um, a role-playing game based on internet culture. And uh, they... Um, you know, they uh, really came up with a wonderful uh, uh, kind of a, a parody of what's going on in some of the stupider Facebook games. And, and it was not approved by Apple uh, after nine weeks of trying to uh, of, of trying to get it in the store. Uh, Apple ended up uh, denying it, uh, according to the guys uh, at Forum Wars, because they can't take a joke. Uh, but uh, in any case, it's a. Uh, it's a funny take on an on an excellent game. You can find out more about it at the on the blog at forumwars dot com, and that's forum yeah, wars that's... with a Z because it's on the internet. Internets, internets. That's what I have, uh, Dane. Do you have anything else you want to talk about? Well, just personal issues, I guess. Yeah. Um, no, I'm just kidding. No. Okay. Where um, can people find good. It? Where can people find out more about your personal issues? Uh, about dot me slash Dane Christensen. Excellent, excellent. And you can find out more uh, at about dot me slash Pete Wright for me. Make sure to head to the naked marketers dot com uh, to uh, learn more about the show and subscribe to the show in iTunes for free. It's the best way that to ensure you don't miss a single episode of Naked Marketing Goodness. Uh, and uh, thanks, Dane. It was good to talk to you today. You too, Pete. Uh, I miss Megan. I uh, miss but- Megan. But uh, hope, I, I hope that implosion thing wasn't an actual like didn't involve physics of any kind. That's right. That's right. Maybe she just had an interview to become an air waitress. Yeah. Yeah. She'd be terrific. She would be terrific. She's very conscientious. Very courteous. <laughs> Until next week, everybody. Uh, on behalf of Dan Christensen, my name's Pete Wright. And we have been the Naked Marketers. <laughs>